Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us with this symposium. I'm Tatiak Naito from the Mask Nutrition and the Kakexia Study Group. In this educational part, we will start with the history and the definition of cancer cachexia. Here's my disclosure. You know, wasting condition caused by various chronic diseases has been known since ancient times in many parts of the world. They called it in different names. In ancient Greece, Hippocrates called it cachexia and considered it as a sign of death. In the Middle East, Abikena called it dek and reported it mainly affects elderly people. In China, the Yellow Emperor called it limpness that immobilized people with chronic diseases due to muscular atrophy. In Japan, it was called Kyoro that was defined as a wasting condition caused by various chronic diseases such as tuberculosis or parasitic infection. The author of this old book in the 10th century showed a clinical picture of his Kyoro patient who was getting thinner and thinner, hungry but unable to eat much, unable to walk long, and did not realize that he is dying until the end of life. This is exactly what we see in patients with cancer cachexia today. Inquiry for causes of cancer cachexia continues for a long time. In 1932, Cyrus Warren, a pathologist of Sahaba University, summarized the result of 500 autopsies to find the immediate cause of cancer death. And he found that one-fifth of cancer patients died of cancer cachexia without visible evidence of infection, hemorrhage, or thrombosis. So we can say that cancer cachexia is a functional disorder due to macroscopically or radiographically invisible causes. Now we know that the causes of cancer cachexia can be partially explained by some humoral factors secreted from the tumor or host tissue. For example, myostatin or PTH-related protein promote muscle or fat degeneration, respectively. While GD15 affects the hypothalamus and suppress appetite. On the other hand, from the host tissue, some inflammatory cytokines such as TNF-alpha or IL-1 or 6 provoke insulin resistance in fat and muscle, promote gluconeogenesis in the liver, and result in anabolic resistance. Here is a recent definition of cancer cachexia proposed by Dr. Fieron in 2011. The target population is patient with malignant tumors. It is a multifactorial disease with negative protein and energy balance characterized by reduced food intake, ongoing muscle loss with or without fat loss, refractory to nutritional support, and physical dysfunction. However, the diagnosis is mainly by, made by the degree of weight loss over the past six months. So far, the diagnostic criteria for precachexia or refractory cachexia is unclear and needed to be updated. If we look at it from a broad perspective, cachexia is a part of cancer-associated weight loss, representing a red-colored area. It's a difficult-to-treat area. In clinical practice, we have to treat the easy-to-treat area first, which include cancer-related symptoms and cancer treatment-related consequences, as shown in this slide because we currently have very limited op treatment options to reverse hypercatabolism, inflammation, and anorexia. Despite recent progress in oncology, cancer cachexia remains strongly prognostic as shown in this prospective cohort study in Japan. As you see here, the larger the degree of weight loss, the shorter the survival time of patients with lung cancer receiving first-line chemotherapy. This fact indicates that cancer cachexia is currently left untreated and is an area of unmet needs. 
Not only that, cachectic cancer patients have decreased physical capacity, poor quality of life, and low tolerance to cancer treatment. As a result, they are easily disabled, stay longer at the hospital, require higher medical costs, and live shorter. Here is a summary of this session. First, cachexia is a metabolic disorder due to various chronic conditions. Second, cancer cachexia is an essential but challenging part of weight loss in cancer. And finally, if we treat it well, it will prolong active life with better quality in our cancer patients. Thank you so much for your attention. Stay safe and I'll see you at the next mask. Bye-bye. Good morning. I'm Egidia Del Fabro. I'm from Virginia Commonwealth University. And today we're going to look at cancer cachexia, which of course we know is a complex problem. And specifically, we're going to address the diagnosis and the treatment. Disclosures, um, this symposium is sponsored by Helsin, and I'm on the advisory board for Pfizer. So when we think about diagnosing cancer cachexia, we think of multiple domains that uh, might be associated with cachexia. Of course, weight loss is dominant, poor appetite. Uh, we know that, of course, most of our patients, unfortunately, with cancer cachexia have weight loss, but in addition to the catabolic process that causes muscle wasting and wasting of fat, they also have decreased food intake. And then this is also associated with muscle loss, fat loss, fatigue, and decreased strength. And of course, this is associated with very important outcomes, treatment toxicity, uh, failure to complete treatment cycles, decreased survival, and poor quality of life. Now, of course, cachexia is uh, prevalent, more prevalent among certain types of cancer, as we can see in this slide, uh, breast cancer and prostate cancer, less likely to be associated with cachexia, while pancreatic cancer, lung, head and neck cancers, of course, uh, are um, very commonly associated with cachexia. And then the average weight loss is also different. And again, the pancreatic cancers, GI cancers are predominantly associated with increased weight loss. Um, and so this is a pivotal trial illustrating the two uh, important aspects of cachexia, namely weight loss, um, but also the fact that reduced survival is a function of body mass index and percent weight loss, meaning that if you have a higher metabolic reserve, if you have fat and you have muscle uh, in reserve, that you can afford to lose more weight, more muscle, more fat before it affects your prognosis and survival. So you can see here that, uh, for example, a patient with a BMI of 20 and a weight loss of just two and a half percent actually has a fairly poor survival with a median survival of 7.6 months. So now there are additional domains, of course, that I haven't mentioned, including the body composition. So the composition of fat and muscle as regards weight loss is important. And patients, for example, who have um, obesity, but have sarcopenia, which is uh, low muscle mass, have poorer outcomes than their counterparts even with uh, just muscle loss. There are other important outcomes and domains, including appetite. And as you can see, this has not been mentioned in the, in the slides uh, so far, but in a series of systematic reviews, looking at appetite as an outcome measure in a series of uh, European intervention studies, it was found that appetite, uh, along with pain, were two very important symptoms in that they predicted prognosis independently of the other conventional um, uh, demographics, uh, clinical features that uh, typically uh, or usually uh, predicted outcome. Uh, in addition, uh, fatigue and function are important domains, dietary intake, physical function, and also whether we should be doing uh, other um, tests such as biomarkers, uh, markers of chronic inflammation, such as 
CRP, which has also been shown to predict prognosis and survival. And when we look at uh, intervening um, in the management of patients with cachexia, uh, the uh, nutritional impact symptoms, uh, which are the ones uh, highlighted in green on the left, are, are important because these are treatable uh, with uh, readily available pharmacological therapy, also with supportive therapy. And a patient who is depressed and anxious uh, might do well with an antidepressant and the appetite decrease may be predominantly associated with depression, anxiety, rather than uh, true cachexia. Also nausea, early satiety, these are other symptoms that of course could easily decrease uh, nutritional intake along with severe pain. The example of a patient that springs to mind is someone with severe mucositis. And, and of course here the management uh, would be opioids. Of course, uh, we have to be concerned about the effect of some of our medications and drowsiness is uh, known to be a, a cause of opioids. So here uh, in the patient who is excessively drowsy, so drowsy that they're unable to eat regularly, deprescribing may be the solution. And then there are other issues related to some specific cancers, such as uh, obstruction, gastrointestinal obstruction, um, uh, which is associated obviously with GI cancers, but also with head and neck cancers. Now, there are also contributors to muscle wasting other than cachexia. There is, of course, aging. And as we um, age, uh, unfortunately, our muscle uh, mass and also our muscle um, quality declines. In addition, there are a host of other endocrine abnormalities, endocrine dysfunction, some of course that are associated specifically with cachexia, but others that may independently cause decrease uh, in uh, muscle size and weakness. And these include low testosterone, uh, vitamin D deficiency, thyroid dysfunction, and a whole host of uh, medications, of course. So uh, what are our goals? Our goals are to identify those patients at risk, uh, and then of course to um, uh, assess them. Now the patients identified at risk might be those uh, who are um, identified on a screening tool such as a MUST tool, um, but we'll go on to uh, management and the multimodality treatment, which is likely to be the key in patients with cachexia. Uh, of course, this is, uh, important to remember that along with exercise, nutritional counseling, and nutritional uh, impact symptoms, um, any pharmacological therapy should be combined with these. I'm going to quickly go through the pivotal trials. So magestral acetate is associated with positive outcomes. The downside is, of course, the possibility of thromboembolism. Uh, corticosteroids in advanced cancer, two trials, 14 days, in the first one and seven days in, in the following one showed an improvement in appetite and fatigue. Unfortunately, the longer we use corticosteroids, the more likely there is uh, that side effects as myopathy and increased infection can occur. Now, ghrelin agonist trials, these are important because uh, they were a hint that there might be an effective therapy for cachexia. And we know about the uh, large Romana trials, the second trial mentioned there, that showed uh, an improvement in weight, muscle mass, uh, but unfortunately did not show an improvement in hand grip strength. And then more recently, pivotal anamorelin trials resulted in the approval of this uh, drug in Japan. And so we're very excited that finally there's an approved drug um, in, in uh, one part of the world and hopefully um, soon uh, will be available um, in the United States and elsewhere. And then of course the inhibitors of pro-inflammatory cytokines that have shown uh, uh, hints at, at benefit, although the early anti-TNF trials did not show any benefit. Um, more recently anti-GDF15 has uh, demonstrated promise. So these are my summary and conclusions. Uh, I, I think it's clear that uh, cancer cachex is important to patients, families, and also important to oncologists because it has an influence on prognosis. I think we should uh, reserve magestral or corticosteroids only in selected 
patients, it's important to consider those supportive care measures, nutritional impact symptoms, especially. And finally, we have new classes of drugs, uh, one of which has been approved uh, uh, for the use of cancer cachexia. And it's always important to remember that multimodality therapy is necessary, even when we combine that with an effective pharmacological therapy. Thank you.